Okay, wonderful. Well, I want to thank you all um, for being here tonight and for staying late um, for the last talk. And I also want to take this opportunity to thank the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation um, for putting on this event and for, um, for actually really playing an instrumental role in um, starting my career um, with the Young Investigator Award. It was really instrumental in helping me um, get my work going. So thank you. Okay. Um, oh, this looks like the end of my talk, actually. So. <laughs> All right, I'm done. Can we go back to the <laughs> Can you back to the beginning, please? Um, so that's me, and um, there's my, my email address at the bottom. If anyone um, has questions that you want to get in touch with me about later, I'm happy to, to answer questions. And I'm going to try to go through this relatively quickly so we can get to all of your questions. Okay. Um, could you do the next slide, please? All right, there we go. Okay. So, um, well, I love this, this picture, um, but um, the, the teenage brain is something that um, we're, we're really just now beginning to really appreciate the degree of this extensive remodeling and rewiring of the brain that goes on during this adolescent period. And so we've known for many years about this critical period that occurs in infant development where you have um, this incredible uh, growth in terms of motor circuitry and then in terms of language development. And so really it's become increasingly clear that something very similar goes on um, in terms of major uh, rewiring of the brain in adolescence that's analogous to this developmental window of increased plasticity that we see in infancy. Okay. So during adolescence, this is, so basically we view this as a time of incredible potential and also a time of incredible vulnerability um, for the development of psychopathology. So um, what might be going wrong in the adolescent brain? Um, we have, uh, oops, sorry about that. Could you go back one? Okay, thank you. So um, we have major gray matter changes. So the gray matter in the brain, um, this is what we, when we talk about brain cells, um, neurons, uh, this is the gray matter in the brain. And so in terms of typical development, what happens is that the synapses in the brain, the connections um, in the brain, are overproduced early in development. And during adolescence, um, this normal process of what we call synaptic pruning eliminates a lot of these um, exuberant or excessive connections. At the same time, we have this process, we have white matter changes, so changes in those fiber tracks, which um, Dr. Wu uh, referred to as the, the internet um, that's connecting the different regions of the brain. And so during uh, this period of adolescence, the brain is continuing to myelinate to develop those white matter fiber tracks, so the regions of the brain are increasingly communicating with each other. Um, so while gray matter is decreasing by this process of pruning, we also have this simultaneous increase going on in white matter development. And so this idea of brain plasticity is really important. So a lot of the potential in many of these vulnerabilities uh, in, in the brain um, may depend on the first two decades of life. Thanks. And so um, in the, the um, early development, between the ages of about three and six, we see rapid growth in uh, frontal circuits. So um, in, uh, depending on, so uh, brain functions like attention, vigilance, and alertness depend on uh, this development. And then uh, later on, around ages seven to 15, we see a growth spurt in um, these brain regions, temporal and parietal lobes, which are critical for language and mathematics development. Now what happens um, between the ages of 16 to 20, this process of synaptic pruning I mentioned, we're actually getting tissue loss um, in this frontal circuitry. So those brain uh, regions and connections are becoming more efficient during this period. And this corresponds to development of increasing self-control, planning, and regulation of behavior. Um, now the frontal cortex is one of the, lit, uh, which is critical for higher order thinking and planning, is one of the latest um, maturing brain structures. And so we think this may have something to do with the, um, you know, some of the risky decision making that goes on during adolescence, um, and possibly also vulnerability to mood disorder during this time period. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what we think is going on. So this is, um, this is a very interesting study done by um, one of my colleagues at UCLA, Adriana Galvan. And um, so what Adriana was 
looking at is um, neural systems that are implicated in reward-seeking behavior. And so we know that um, during adolescence, um, adolescents are um, extremely uh, sensitive to rewards, interested in, in seeking rewards, and um, this may have to do with vulnerability to things like substance abuse and, and of course, also um, mood disorder. So um, in this task, this was a functional neuroimaging study, and functional neuroimaging is a methodology where you're basically looking at the brain, um, either during rest or during a particular cognitive activity, and you can see which regions of the brain are active when the person is performing that task. And so in this task, um, the uh, well, this was done with children, adolescents, and adults. And so they um, they showed people a cue which corresponded to a particular reward. And so with this pirate, so if he holds up his cup, it means you get a tiny reward. And then um, basically, you know, these different cues, if he's looking in his um, telescope, then it's the biggest reward. And so basically, people didn't realize that these cues corresponded to the reward, but um, they were, so basically they saw the cue, then um, they uh, had a, a period of fixation, and then they saw um, whatever their reward was going to be. And um, the, the, what's called the ventral striatum in the brain is a region of the brain that's particularly um, sensitive to rewards. And there we go. And so um, what Adriana found here was that, um, first of all, overall, so in this, um, this region in the ventral striatum, the nucleus accumbens, um, uh, this structure right here, which I'm trying to point to, but those little red dots on the top, um, we actually, and also in the lateral orbital frontal cortex, which is also a very, uh, brain region that's sensitive to reward, we see that um, there's basically a linear increase across all the subjects, depending on whether it was a small, medium, or large reward. So you, you know, those, those brain regions are lighting up more when you're getting a bigger reward. Or we're seeing it when you're seeing a cue that's signaling a, bit or a bigger reward. But what was really interesting was that um, we actually, when they broke it out into children versus adolescents and adults, it was actually a very different um, pattern in terms of activity in the nucleus accumbens um, in the adolescents who, they, and these are healthy adolescents, but were basically, um, particularly when it was a large reward or a cue indicating a large reward, the adolescents were really lighting up those uh, subcortical brain regions. Um, and and so really this idea that there's these different developmental trajectories um, for these, these brain regions, they relate to um, this notion of the increases that we see during adolescence in terms of these impulsive and risky behaviors. And this may, this increased sensitivity to reward may also be related to increased mood lability and the mood dysregulation that we, we often see in adolescence. Now, that's not the only thing going on in adolescence. Obviously, there's a lot of other changes going on um, in the brain and um, hormonally. So uh, next slide, please. So one of the other key um, developmental changes that's going on um, during adolescence is in terms of sleep and um, changes in circadian patterns. And this is one of the factors that we're starting to look more at now as something that we think is really relevant to um, uh, mood lability in adolescence. So, um, Newborns sleep about 16 to 18 hours. Um, and um, at age five, we get about 11 hours of sleep on average. That really shifts a lot in adolescence, where nighttime sleep reduces from about nine hours at age 13 to um, less than eight hours at age 16. There's also a circadian shift that occurs in adolescence, where um, there's a delay in the circadian phase and sleep onset. And so that, that um, uh, circadian phase often shifts to past midnight. And so for those of you that have teenagers at home, um, you may have noticed this kind of shift in their sleeping behavior. Um, I have a nine-year-old, and I hear from my friends that, you know, this, this shift is coming. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, so there's also, at the same time that this um, circadian shift is going on, there's actually an increased biological need um, for sleep that occurs with, with puberty. And so the sleep-wake cycle, um, this is a really important part of our biology, and sleep-wake cycle is um, regulated by the interaction between the circadian rhythm, which is driven by a structure called the suprachiasmatic nucleus um, in the hypothalamus of the brain. And so this is really a homeostatic process um, determined by prior sleep and wakefulness, and so it's a really important uh, regulatory function of the body to maintain wakefulness during the day and promote sleep at night. And we think, and well, this is very clearly the case, actually, that um, in um, people with mood disorders, that this um, circadian rhythm, this homeostasis is disrupted. So um, some of the lines of evidence for a central role of sleep disturbance uh, in bipolar disorder in particular, um, 
Sleep disturbances, we know, are among the most prominent correlates of mood episodes and also of inadequate recovery in bipolar patients. So if you look at in-between episodes, the people who are not doing well in-between uh, severe mood episodes are the ones that have the most severe sleep dysregulation. Um, and there's a lot, um, several lines of evidence that impaired sleep can actually induce or um, a, a manic episode. So if you sleep deprive someone who is, um, has bipolar disorder, that will often precipitate um, a manic episode. And sleep disturbance is often one of the most common prodromal or precursors of mania, and um, it's also the sixth most common prodrome of depression. So sleep is a really key issue in, in mood disorders. And uh, this is, um, a quote from um, Emil Kreiflin, who was a German psychiatrist in the 1900s who actually um, observed many uh, patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder over many, many years who were in an institution. And um, he says, he observed, and he wrote in his journal about this, and he observed that um, the attacks of manic depressive insanity are invariably accompanied by all kinds of bodily changes. By far the most striking are the disorders of sleep and general nourishment. In mania, sleep in the more severe states of excitement is always considerably encroached upon. Sometimes there's almost complete sleeplessness, and most interrupted for a few hours, which may last for weeks and even months. In states of depression, in spite of great need for sleep, it is encroached upon the patient's life for hours, sleepless in bed, although even in bed they find no refreshment. So this is something that's been observed for hundreds of years um, about uh, the pathophysiology of mood disorders. The other thing I want to mention about sleep, I mean, it's something that we take for granted, and yet it's an incredibly important biological function. And um, in fact, uh, in the 1850s, um, Several cases were documented of um, florid mania, patients with mania who um, had almost no sleep and actually died um, as a result of this sleeplessness. And we also see this in animal models of sleep deprivation. Um, so prolonged uh, sleep deprivation in animals, despite getting adequate food intake, will eventually lead to death. So, so you know, <laughs> it's, it's a pretty uh, important aspect. So basically, um, sleep deprivation produces a reliable syndrome involving debilitated appearance, skin lesions, decreased food intake, weight loss, increased energy expenditure, uh, body, uh, decreased body temperature, changes in norepinephrine and thyroxine, and eventually death. So um, regular sleep <laughs> and getting regular sleep is, is really, really critical. And so this is a model, um, this is um, several years old, this model, but I think it's a very compelling model of um, some of the, the factors that may trigger and precipitate a mood disorder. So um, essentially, and you can see that some of these factors are um, internal factors um, that you may not have that much control over, and some of them are external factors that you could actually do something about. So um, for example, um, sometimes people have a primary sleep disorder, something like obstructive sleep apnea that prevents them from getting adequate sleep. Um, causes sleep reduction. There are um, other things uh, like drugs, um, illness, and so forth, um, emotional reactions, and then also um, events that disrupt one's sleep schedule. So having a baby is a big one, um, but um, doing shift work and um, having irregular show social activities and so forth, um, leading to sleep deprivation. So basically, there are multiple pathways to sleep deprivation. You can have insomnia for various reasons. You can also have sleep reduction because of your schedule. And um, those uh, types of events and a sleep dysregulation can precipitate uh, an episode of, of mania. OK. And so we know that. Um, uh, circadian rhythm is a really key aspect of the biology. Uh, disruption of circadian rhythm is a really key aspect of the biology of, of bipolar disorder. And it's also very relevant to unipolar major depression as well. Um, so we see this diurnal um, daily mood variation, um, this um, cyclic pattern of uh, manic and depressive states. And um, there's also seasonal affective disorder, um, uh, which is a mood disorder that um, particularly appears in, in winter. And um, and some of the treatment for that is um, giving people a very bright morning light. And so somehow regular, which, which uh, regularizes uh, regular, that circadian rhythm. There's also um, a mouse model um, involving a, a, a mutation in the clock gene. 
which is a circadian protein. And so this uh, clock knockout mouse um, exhibited manic-like behaviors, which are actually reversed with lithium treatment, which is a, a primary uh, first-line treatment for bipolar disorder. And um, that gene is involved in uh, regulation of dopaminergic activity also. So we think that's relevant to the biology of mood disorder. Next slide. And so um, this just uh, is a review of um, basically, I mean, one of the things that I'm really interested in is how can we predict um, before someone actually develops a disorder, how can we predict that? And so it turns out that for um, predicting mania, um, some of the uh, symptoms, so mood symptoms were um, reasonable, for, were noticed, and these are uh, retrospective studies, so basically in people that developed a mood disorder, um, going back and asking their, their family members and them what was the first thing you noticed. And, um, so, and, and some of these you notice are very, very large studies. And so, um, so mood symptoms, so things like episodic mood change, depressed mood, or elevated mood were noticed, but um, sleep disturbances were pretty universal, and particularly um, either sleep disturbance or decreased need for sleep um, as a prodrome or precipitant to an initial manic episode. Um, also, mood lability is another one. And so um, sleep in adolescence, and I mentioned this already, that there's a big shift that occurs in uh, sleep during adolescence. It's just part of the natural um, changes in circadian biology. But um, there's really, I, there's really a, a sort of perfect storm in terms of these changes in circadian biology and um, the risk for mood lability and, and sort of cultural factors that are going on in terms of adolescent sleep as well. So. Um, Insufficient sleep and irregular sleep-wake uh, schedules among adolescents has um, really become a pretty major um, health concern. And so, um, this was um, a study looking at a very large study looking at teenagers in Japan and Korea, um, finding that they were actually more sleep-deprived than um, teenagers in, in Western countries, with um, getting only um, 5.4 to 6.3 hours of sleep a night on school nights. So, you know, incredible amounts of homework, things like that, and. Um, the, uh, there was a sleep habit survey, which was a, uh, given to about 3,000 people, finding that um, students who slept uh, less than uh, six hours and 45 minutes of school night, um, or had um, a greater than um, a, a two-hour weekend bedtime delay. So basically, if you were having a very disrupted schedule, or you're going to bed at a certain time on um, school nights, and then going to bed much, much later on, on weekend nights, um, those um, uh, children or teenagers had increased daytime sleepiness, more depressed mood, and um, sleep-wake behavior problems. And poor sleep is also associated with poor academic performance um, for adolescents from middle school through college. Um, Another study, a very large study of over 6,000 um, adolescents, found that eveningness, which is um, a tendency to um, be you know, more of a night person, to stay up late at night and uh, wake up later in the morning, um, that this trait was associated with more daytime sleepiness, more attention problems, um, poor school achievement, uh, more injuries, um, more kind of emotional ability, and um, more overall sleep disturbance. And so um, this was also, and so there's some international studies, so they also found this in Taiwan where um, basically uh, the evening type was also a risk factor for increased moodiness and um, mood disorder. So in essence, um, sleep disruption is a, a risk factor for the development of mood disorder and um, particularly this um, tendency towards eveningness or being a night owl um, it may be an indicator for adolescents with um, behavior, uh, behavioral or emotional problems um, and uh, potentially risky behaviors. So um, there's clearly sleep is very important to well-being, not only um, in, in people with mood disorder, but also in the general population, and particularly for adolescents. Um, we know that sleep affects learning and motivation, and um, poor sleep is also associated with memory impairments. Um, and is, is, um, sleep is also uh, very much involved in normal emotion regulation. Next slide. So, of course, a question that comes up is really, what is the causal pathway here um, between sleep disruption, mood disorder, and so forth? And so if you start, um, and this is just an example, um, I'm not saying that the clock gene is responsible for all cases of bipolar disorder, it's certainly not, um, but just as an example, let's take a genetic mutation, like the uh, clock gene mutation, um, which leads to sleep disruption. 
And then you have um, basically an adolescent whose sleep is disrupted, um, causing them to be increasingly irritable, increasingly moody um, because they're tired and cranky. And then that leads to a situation where you have more hostile family interactions, um, causing increased disruption of um, frontolimbic neural circuitry in the brain, um, leading to increased sleep disruption. So this is just a, a hypothetical model of the kind of um, situation you can see where this gene environment interaction can really lead to the onset of a, of a significant mood disorder. So, um, of course, the question is, um, what, can, what can you do? And I think that, I mean, the great thing about sleep is that, um, well, there, I mean, there are certainly internal factors that disrupt sleep, but on the other hand, there are a lot of things that can be done to regularize, regularize sleep. Um, so really healthy lifestyle interventions um, can, can play a huge role. And so some suggestions, um, you know, and this is something that I always I recommend for um, patients with, with bipolar disorder in particular, I cannot um, underestimate the importance of just having a regular, a regular sleep schedule. Um, and so, for adolescents in particular, there's a lot of, um, you know, internet, phone, uh, video games that go on late at night. And so, basically, having a limit in terms of screen time um, is something that we recommend for adolescents. Um, having a regularly regular schedule activities, um, limiting caffeine intake, and then also avoiding overscheduling. I think um, I don't know how many of you have teenagers at home, but um, you know, one, one thing is that teenagers tend to have a lot of activities, and um, that's something that is challenging to get them to, you know, their activities and get them to bed on time and so forth. But that is um, something that's, that's really important um, to try and, and have a very, as, as much of a regular schedule as possible to avoid some of that um, disruption. And um, finally, I just want to thank all of um, my funding sources and thank you all for your attention. Thank you.